thank you. Uh, and thank you to the organisers for the invitation to be here. Um, and thank you all of you for coming in on a Saturday morning. It's great to see so many faces here. So I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing with some of my colleagues, both at the University of Queensland and the University of Melbourne. And we're looking at how we can take uh, evidence that we understand about how the brain and the mind learn and think about how we might use that meaningfully in education. So our core question in all of this is, what does quality learning in education look like? What does it mean when we try to develop something that is of high quality? What sort of evidence are we using um, to inform that? Um, and how do we make sense of that so that we can help teachers to do the best job that they can? This is a conversation that's been going on for a long time. So these two gentlemen um, had a big argument about 100 years ago. Um, this is John Dewey and Thorndike. And basically the argument that they were having is whether or not it's better to inform education through uh, kind of laboratory type studies where you can control for various different factors and figure out what's happening in learning or, in the case of Dewey, whether it's something that we need to look more closely in a particular classroom environment to figure out what's going on. Um, so this has been a, tradition, a long tradition in North America, in Europe um, and in Australia as well. Now, Interestingly, this argument is still going on, um, for better or worse. So this is something that's been happening for 100 years and you still see lots of comments about supposedly which side won. So here's a comment on Twitter, for example, about how Dewey lost and Thorndike won and apparently there are too many scientists and psychologists looking at how we might improve education. Um, I'm one of them, so I'm <laughs> not sure how I feel about that. The other side of this is that we've got people who are saying that um, this kind of view of education where it's very contextualised and very focused on what happens in individual classes is missing out on some of the key things that we understand about how learning works and that it was uh, potentially heading off in the wrong direction. So some really good examples of some of the arguments that you see here are things around um, phenomena like learning styles. You've all probably heard about learning styles. I'm a visual learner or I'm an auditory learner or I'm a kinesthetic learner. The evidence from the research, um, highly controlled studies, including some studies that I've been involved in, shows that it makes basically no difference whatsoever whether somebody thinks that they're a visual learner or an auditory learner or whatever. Um, so there are some really highly contentious ideas here and two camps that are really in strong disagreement with each other and have been for about 100 years. Unfortunately, this has become a little bit extreme in some of the conversations around this. Um, so there was one chapter in this book that basically compared psychologists doing work in education to Nazis, which <laughs> was an interesting take. Um, so sometimes people talk about this argument as being trads versus progs or people who believe in a sort of more traditional way of thinking about education which is knowledge based, um, based on generalisable research and a more progressive way of thinking which is much more embedded in uh, complexities that happen in the classroom. Um, sensibly, thankfully, there are some people who are trying to say maybe it's a balance of both of these things. Um, but the point here is that even within the last month, this was an article that was in the national media in Australia, again, this debate has been ignited. So um, this particular academic was making the argument that science um, and think the science of learning has no place in education at all and that there should be a complete ban on it. Um, again, a, a very interesting take. Not good news for me if they decide to go down that path. Um, okay, so that's the sort of historical context in which we're understanding how evidence is thought about and used um, in education, particularly in, a, in an Australian context, but certainly in North America and Europe as well, these arguments tend to, to go on, despite the fact that it's been happening for about 100 years, worryingly. So the key questions for us underneath this are what, what do we actually understand about how learning works and how do we meaningfully translate that into something that teachers can use? So something that can actually make a real difference in education. We're not the first to think about this, um, particularly in the United States. Uh, over the last 20 years or so, there's been quite an emphasis on this. 
Um, there have been some really good resources that have been developed on the basis of that. This is one of them, um, a, real, a guide to how we learn in the, in the brain and mind and what it might mean for education. There's actually a second edition or a second version of this that's come out more recently, again carrying this tradition about you know, the brain, the mind, what it means in education. There was also the development of this website, um, the What Works Clearinghouse. Again, the idea here is to bring together all of the things that we understand about how learning works in a way that teachers um, and educational leaders, policy makers, can look at and say, yes, there's really good evidence for this, um, but here we've got some areas like learning styles where the evidence is a bit more mixed. Um, so we've picked up on a kind of trend that's been going on for, for some time. Um, interestingly, again, there are some directions in which this is, has gone that are quite um, surprising, if you like. Um, people are talking about how the brain might be engaged in acrobatics. Um, there is also a whole new emphasis, particularly in the last five years, about thinking about how we might use data science, machine learning, um, and computational psychology to try and better understand what's going on in our brains while we're learning and what we might get from that to help improve education. That becomes obviously really complicated um, once you start going down the path of using large data sets and um, thinking about how computer science might help us to, on this on this process, so very early days on that, but an interesting development nonetheless. So what's the problem? This all sounds really exciting. I think it's probably not controversial to say that in the last 20 years, we've probably learned more about how the brain and the mind work than we have throughout history. We've got all sorts of amazing machines um, that can look at what's happening in people's brains while they're learning, um, and the precision and um, fidelity of the kinds of things that we can do in neuroscience have increased exponentially um, over that 20-year period. So there's some really exciting developments, but there's some problems. One, and a very interesting one, is that particularly when we go and talk to teachers, this is one of the first responses that we get, is that when you talk about what's happening in the brain, it's very exciting and people can get caught up in that excitement. So this is a fantastic study where basically they gave people, um, two groups of people, the same lot of information. One group got uh, information that had pictures of brains in it and had a kind of neuroscience element to it. The other um, information was exactly the same but didn't have the neuroscience element. The people who read the neuroscience one were far more likely to believe it and got excited about it. So simply adding the brain into the um, discussion changes people's minds far more readily than it does otherwise. So there is an, a, a sort of seductive allure, as they've said here, about neuroscience in education. Some people have actually argued that this is really detrimental. So um, this was an article by Max Coulthart, who's um, one of the eminent um, psychological scientists in Australia, uh, and he was very critical about how neuroscience is being used in, in education. Um, saying that it's being hijacked and all very weird. Um, some of my colleagues uh, in the centre that I've been involved in that I'll talk about shortly uh, have also said that it's most of the kind of discussion about the brain in the classroom is, is fairly meaningless and I'll explain why in a second. One of the real challenges here is that we're trying to understand something that happens um, in a small part of the brain over a very short time period and trying to make sense of that what it, in terms of what it means for students who are potentially learning lessons that are going to take days, weeks, or in higher education, it can take six years to become an architect or a psychologist. So what can we understand from what's happening in a small part of the brain over a small time period in relation to that kind of learning trajectory? And I think the computer scientists, for their um, interesting ways that they go about things, had some really interesting ideas about this. So this was a, um, an idea that came from John Anderson and initially uh, Alan Newell, who are very famous computer scientists, who were trying to break down the kinds of levels at which we try to understand particularly cognitive phenomena like learning. And this sort of brought it into perspective for me in that if you look down the bottom here, the neuroscience element, we're really looking at very, very short time spans and in very small parts of the brain. Right. And what we're trying to do there is then make sense of what that means in seven orders of magnitude away in time and space. You know, students learn in a classroom, in a neighbourhood, in a world 
often the lessons that they need to learn will take days, weeks, months. So there's a big difference in time and space between the research that we're doing in neuroscience and where we're trying to apply it in the classroom. And that's what makes this process really difficult. Another way to think about this is that we've got a sort of continuum. Right? It's not always this clean, but you'll get the idea. Uh, at the one end, we've got the things that are happening in people's brains, what's going on in their neurons, uh, what's happening there. At the other extreme, we've got what's happening in the classroom, right? the complex, messy classroom environment. Now, if we were to take a look at how people learn down that end, right? so if we looked at everybody's brains in the room, we would find that they pretty much work in the same way. All right, there's ion channels and the neurons communicate in the same way. So we can be pretty certain that when we look at all of how all of us learn at that level, it's going to look more or less the same, all right? Um, because that's how our brains work. And we've got really good evidence of these sorts of things from MRI studies. So when I'm reading or you're reading, for most of us, similar parts of our brains lighting up, doing similar sorts of things, OK? At the other end, when we start to look at the classroom, if I was to look at how all of you would learn in a different sort of classroom situation, all of us would learn in slightly different ways. Some of us would learn in very different ways. Some of us like, might like to take notes. Some of us might like to just listen. Um, some of us might like to go away and read some more later on. So there's a lot of variation when we start to think about what uh, a classroom full of students looks like. Right? Very different. That's where the challenge comes in. So every step that we go away from the brain towards the classroom, we're adding more and more and more complexity in terms of trying to understand what's happening with our students. It's not as simple as saying all of their brains are the same. So thankfully, we were um, fortunate enough to get some funding to look at this. And over the last five years, I've been involved in a Science of Learning Research Centre in Australia, which was a national initiative that was funded by the Australian government. And basically, that's what we were tasked to do, is to try and say, what can we understand about what's happening in these sorts of images when we think about how people learn, what we might learn from things like uh, electroencephalogram, so the electrical activity that's going on in people's brains while they're learning. If you've never done this kind of research, it's very expensive um, and messy, but very interesting, and think about what it might mean in our classrooms. Um, that's one of the lecture theatres at the University of Queensland. Um, I've actually sat in sessions in that room. It's very distracting. There's a lake in the background and there's ducks and it's, <laughs> it's very pretty, um, but quite distracting. So that was our task. We were funded to figure out how we might um, look at neuroscience, experimental psychology, um, look at all the great things that have happened over the last few decades and think about what they might mean in the classroom. So what do we do? What did we do about this? It was very interesting from the beginning that there was quite some disagreement between people at different ends of the spectrum, even about fundamental issues like what is learning. So we had people involved in the centre who were cellular neuroscientists at one end, um, psychologists, we had education researchers, and we had um, several departments of education, policy makers, and so on. So we had a very broad spectrum. And right from the beginning, it became clear that it was very difficult for us to have conversations about what evidence in education might mean. Um, we couldn't agree on what learning was. Um, feedback means something very different to a neuroscientist than it does to an educator or an education researcher. So we had to think about how we could start to break those barriers down. The group that I worked with most closely were actually interested in thinking about this across a couple of different um, levels. One was that we wanted to try and get a sense of a core idea and think about how that idea might look at these different levels of analysis. So what does it mean if we're looking at an idea at a neuroscience level? What does it mean when we get to psychology and education research and how does that then play out in, in practice? So we wanted to get a sense of this whole trajectory ourselves. Right? Um, probably would have been easier if we could have had a, a, a more fruitful conversation with our neuroscience colleagues from the beginning, but we figured that it would probably actually make sense for us to try and do this ourselves and then think about what that translation process might look like. So we attacked a core problem from a number of different directions. So let's start right down the end. Um, so we decided that looking at some issues around how people make mistakes in learning uh, and how they have difficulties and what happens when they get confused. So that was our core theme. 
right? Because we knew that there was some interest in that uh, at a neuroscience level and obviously at the classroom level. The other thing that I think is, gives us a bit of a clue here, and I'll come back to this at the end, is that there seem to be some common themes that people were talking about. So this is um, a philosophy of neuroscience um, book on the end here, which is about how we make predictions and are wrong, but it's very neuroscience based. At the other end, we've got educators who are saying, what happens when we fail, get something wrong and then recover. So there were some core elements there that we thought were kind of similar which gave us some clues of things that we could follow up. One of the easiest ways to, to look at this, we found, was to look at misconceptions. So if somebody's got a conceptual idea that's wrong, that needs to be updated, that's not quite sophisticated enough, how can we look at that and understand the kinds of mistakes they might be making about those ideas? So here's, here's the first study that we, we did on this. Now, we gave people statements like this one. Right, and we just simply asked them whether they thought that they were true or false. Is that one true or false? Anyone game to say? It's false. <laughs> it's false. <laughs> um, and then we asked them how confident they were. All right, so the, a lot of these were very tricky, very tricky statements. They had to say true or false. Um, and then we also tested them using a very basic sort of EEG setup, so to try and figure out what's going on in their brain. What we found is that if people were really confident and wrong, they were more likely to learn. Right? And it didn't matter so much whether they were making a lot of mistakes or whether their mistakes were pretty rare. Right? We manipulated that. We were a bit cruel. Sometimes we told them that they got the answer wrong when they got it right. <laughs> so we could manipulate how often they were getting errors. It didn't matter how often that was. If they were more confident, they were more likely to actually remember and use that knowledge later. All right? So if you're confident and wrong, it might not happen a lot, but it actually can be a really powerful learning experience. Interestingly, we saw differences in their EEG patterns. So we could see real differences of what in what was happening in their brains. Um, so the blue lines on either of these, and it again, it doesn't matter so much whether they were making errors a lot um, or they were fairly infrequent. Um, there was a difference in their brain activity in the, um, the evoked response potential or the particular time period that we were looking at. What it told us is that surprise is the key element here. I think I know something I'm very confident about knowing it, but I'm wrong. What? All right, so there was something about surprise that was important here that we could see in people's brains. So, tick, that was a good start. Then we moved on. So from there, we wanted to think more about, okay, let's have a look at similar ideas and how they play out in a more experimental psychology type setup, so a cognitive science type study. So the, the key here, again, is to figure out what's going on when people are confident but wrong, okay? Now, this might ring some bells for anybody who's familiar with some of this literature. There is a very famous Dunning-Kruger effect, which is people who are new to an area new to a discipline, um, can often overestimate how much they know. Right? So they make an overestimation. Um, and you might have experienced this. So I've certainly experienced this. Um, I've started reading some material uh, and then read a couple of Wikipedia pages. And Oh, yeah, I completely understand quantum physics now. <laughs> Clearly I didn't. Um, so it's very easy for us to overestimate how much we know about some things. Um, again, a core theme going through some of these things that we could look at. This time, we gave people a big, a very big list of these um, types of, um, we were calling them urban myths, but they're things that people often have a misconception about. So maybe pick one or two out of that list and see if you think they're true or false. Not sure? Do you want the answer? <laughs> Some of them are a bit surprising. Elephants do only have two knees. <laughs> there you go. What was important about this is that there was a key manipulation here. There are two different types of statements. All right? So the first one is pretty straightforward. Um, the Golden Gate Bridge either is orange or it isn't. All right? um, hydrogen, oxygen being the most plentiful elements in the, in the universe, it's, it's either, kind of either true or it's not. The second one, however, 
um, and I used to be a chef and I used to actually believe this, is not true. Why this is different is that it's not just a single piece of factual information. Right? It's more conceptual. So you've actually got to understand a number of things before this statement can make sense. All right? So there are things that were very factual and things that were much more conceptual. We wanted to see what the difference was there. Now, I'll run you through each of these one at a time. So overall, people tended to be better at the factual questions than the conceptual ones. Not a huge difference, but there was a, a meaningful difference there. Interestingly, both of these other graphs here are about their confidence in their accuracy. Now, their overall confidence in the middle there, much more confident with conceptual ideas than factual ones, despite the fact that they're better at the factual ones. Worryingly, that is even bigger when they're wrong. Right? The difference is even bigger. So people are much more likely to be confident that they understand something and know about it if it's um, conceptual and it even holds if they're wrong. Right? Maybe there's something in there for politicians. Not going there. Um, <laughs> so we found here that people really have trouble with concepts. Right? And again, this idea of confidence is playing into it. So theme, again, carries across. People are confident and wrong, often, with these sorts of conceptual ideas. OK, so let's start to think about what that might mean as we get closer to a classroom environment. Again, similar ideas, thinking about what this might mean. In this case, we looked at particular lessons that are being used in real classes, in real university classes, to try and see if similar sorts of patterns are emerging. We used a couple of different um, modules for this. Um, there's a couple of examples here. This one is a, a, an interactive uh, widget that people can use on the, online. And basically all you do here is that you can adjust all of these values. It's basically about what happens to people's blood alcohol concentration over time. You can adjust all of those values, run the simulation, and it will give you um, a calculation about how people's blood alcohol will change. Importantly, there's a key misconception built into this that a lot of people tend to get wrong, and that is it doesn't matter what time you go to sleep, it's not going to make you sober up any faster. All right? A lot of our undergraduate students seem to think that it would. So that was a, a deliberate misconception built into that module. We also use a number of others, including one that looks like this. This is a, from a real um, module that is used at Arizona State University. In this case, students are given um, some information about stars and they're asked, what is the relationship between the size of a star and what its lifespan is? Now, the misconception here is that most people think that big stars have longer lifespans. They don't. Right? Big stars tend to burn out a lot faster. So again, there's a key misconception built into the module that people needed to work through. So what happens is that they make that prediction and then this is kind of cool in that they get to create their own star and then speed up time so that they can watch what happens to that virtual star, obviously not a real one, um, as it goes through its lifespan. So very quickly they start to realise that um, bigger stars don't live longer. So it's a very um, active way of getting them to understand the lifespan of stars. Again, key element here, misconceptions, making a prediction and then seeing whether or not it plays out. The advantage of doing this is that we're able to look at a number of different factors when we start to get into the real world environment. Particularly with these digital environments, um, we can track how people go. So as they go through the various different elements of the lesson, they might get stuck and go around, or they might spend a lot of time on one particular aspect that they might be confused about. Um, so we've got a lot of uh, log data. What they click on, how long they spend on things, how long they read things, what, how many stars they create, all of those sorts of things. Those can give us some clues about how confident they are when they're doing these sorts of lessons. So students who are really confident will tend to go through these things very quickly. Right? Yes, I understand this, click, 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 click. Students who are less confident will take their time. So we've got some clues because we've got a misconception built into this and we can see how students are behaving real students. So this is from a real data set with real students um, as they work through this module. The, again, the idea here is to see whether or not these same ideas carry through from, from neuroscience to the classroom. 
One other thing that we did ask with a smaller group of these students is to get them to actually tell us what their experience was like as they worked through this module. So there's a little bit happening here, I'll, I'll walk you through it. So basically each of the columns here represents part of the module that they worked through. So they made a prediction about star size and its lifespan. They then went through and created those stars to see what would happen. Then they were given an opportunity to correct the misconception that they had then they were given an explanation about how gravity works and how that impacts on the way that the stars evolve over their lifespan. Now, we asked them across a number of different factors. So this was um, more of a qualitative study. So we just got them to report what they were experiencing during each of the modules. We, we used a video stimulated recall for this. So we took a screen capture of their video, played it back to them, and they told us what they were experiencing. The heavier the line, the more students experienced that at that particular point of the module. Right? So from the beginning, when they were asked to make a prediction, quite a lot of them got confused. Right? Then as they worked through the observations, it started to make sense to them. They were able to resolve their misconception. Then when they were given the extra information, um, some of them got confused again. Some of them were um, able to resolve that and were really interested. Some of them got frustrated and bored. Right? So, we're starting to see how the differences between the students start to play out when we ask them what their experience was like. And that partly is represented in their behaviour as well. Okay, um, so all of that part of our work, we summarised in, in a paper that came out last year where we tried to pull all of this together. So what does it mean from the neuroscience side to the classroom when we're thinking about what happens when people have difficulties in their learning get confused uh, and need some help or not. Okay, so we did pull all that together eventually. It was a lot of work. Okay, that's great. All right, difficulties seem to be important. We don't want students to be overconfident. We know that some people have trouble with, with conceptual ideas, but how does this actually help teachers in a classroom environment? That's the real challenge. So now we're thinking about what happens right down, down this, this end of the equation. Okay, we took a little bit of a different approach to this. Um, so, as I said, part of the f reason that we were given the funding by the Australian Government was to think about how this might impact on teachers in, in the real classroom. So, one of the aspects of the work was to think about higher education, universities, um, vocational education, etc. Uh, a lot of the work was focused on um, primary, secondary levels of education, we were focused on the tertiary level. So. What we wanted to do with this is to find the people who we thought were the um, experts in the world on these issues. So we developed a long list of people who published widely in this area and we spoke to quite a few of them. We were lucky enough to get hour-long interviews with 24 of these people internationally recognised for their work um, in trying to understand how the science of learning will apply, particularly to university education. 24 interviews, uh, and we basically asked them these three questions. So, what are the sort of key principles that we need to understand? Um, how can they be translated for effective university teaching? And then, what really is in the literature that might uh, actually help here? Right? And digging down into those sorts of issues. If we're not sure how to do it, I guess the best thing we can do is ask the people who we think probably know best about this stuff. So, that's what we did. Now, I know you can't really see what's happening there. It, it really is just to give you a sense that there was quite a lot of uh, different themes that emerged from those conversations. So, 24 hours worth of um, interviews with, with very high-level experts, there was a lot of stuff that came out of it. Uh, and when we started to connect all of the different themes together, as you can see, it got very complicated. Um, I know you can't see the elements of that, but we just wanted you to get a sense that it was really, really hard. Um, this is what we came down with when we distilled it. So the point here was to try and attack this from the other side and say, well, okay, what do we think teachers need to know most about? And after those conversations, we arrived on these seven principles. It always seems to be somewhere between five and seven. Interestingly, without us deliberately prompting it, you'll notice that challenges and difficulties appear there again. All right, so Almost all of our experts said that some deliberate way in which we think about um, how we might introduce challenges or difficulties, address misconceptions, think about student confidence, uh, are one of the key things that we need to consider. Uh, and of course, there are a number of others there that probably are fairly intuitive, 
given that you know, everybody in the room's had some education, probably a lot of people have done some teaching. Um, probably not any huge surprises there, but I think the, uh, when I talk to people about this, often it's the challenges and difficulty one that is pe people want to know more about and are interested in. So across all of these different elements of the research that we've been doing, we found that there were some of these common features. So we were talking about errors, um, whether they're predictive errors in the brain or errors in the classroom, challenge, difficulty, confusion, um, although that's much harder to see in somebody's brain. It's a much more diffuse kind of emotion uh, and emotional experience. Confidence and surprise. Carried through in all of the different levels that we were trying to understand what was going on. So what did we learn from all of this? So we're here talking about um, evidence-based and evidence-informed practice. We went about it in a fairly unorthodox way in trying to understand what the different um, ways in which we might collect evidence about these ideas might tell us about what we can do in the classroom. What did we learn from all of that? One thing we learned um, goes back to some of the things that Wittgenstein was talking about, in particular this notion of family resemblance. So while a neuroscientist might be talking about prediction error and um, teachers might be talking about mistakes in the classroom, they do share some sort of conceptual resemblance. They're sort of hovering around a similar idea, even though they're coming at it at very different levels of analysis. So that gave us some, uh, some hope that we could at least share a common language about these things. We talked, again, to a number of um, leading researchers in this area, and we got a few of them to write um, chapters for this book that we put together a couple of years ago. And interestingly, we found that a lot of the approaches to translating the evidence into practice tended to fall into one of four categories. Right? Now, this might apply to other areas of translation, but it was certainly something that we saw again and again in the way that people are thinking about this in education. So one of them is purely functional. So this is what part of the brain does what? Right? Frontal lobe, what does the frontal lobe do? What does the visual cortex at the back of the brain, what does that do? Right? So it's very focused on this bit of the brain does this. Probably not so easy to then think about what that might mean in a classroom. Right, unless you've got kids that are running into the wall or, or something like that. Second level, possibly not surprising, is a kind of diagnostic approach. Right? Can we use brain imaging to help us to understand dyslexia or dyscalculia or other kinds of learning difficulties that might be occurring in um, students' brains? Again, that sort of makes sense. Right? Understanding how those things work um, is, is very important. At a conceptual level, this is where it gets a little bit more tricky and is probably the space where we were in, trying to understand how the concept of error and failure um, works in a kind of neuroscience context across to how it works in a classroom. It's much more conceptual and not easy to do a one-to-one -one translation across different levels. The one that everybody's looking for, though, is the last one. So this idea here, and I think particularly some of my neuroscience colleagues are very keen on this idea that we can do some neuroimaging studies and that we can just go out to teachers and say, here's your prescription about what you need to do for your students now, um, which obviously teachers are not very happy about, <laughs> understandably. So although we would like to think that we could go out and provide teachers a recipe to help them to do what they're doing better, that simply isn't feasible. Right? That prescriptive approach doesn't work. Uh, and we've looked across a whole lot of different literature and, and seen reliably that it, it tends to fall down. The key here is that when we've got these kinds of things, it really is about crossing this barrier from developing a set of principles into what teachers do in their practice. So for most of this continuum, we were able to make a fairly meaningful transition from one level to another. But when we take what we understand about how learning works and attempt to put it in practice, that's where it becomes much more complicated. It's not as easy as saying, here's a formula for, for you to figure out how you might do your teaching. Lots of people have tried this. All right, so if you're in an airport any time in the near future, if you go into the bookstore, there'll be some sort of self-help section of some description. There will be any number of books in there, like these ones, who will give you the keys to successful learning. All right, often, like what we did, there'll be X number of principles of learning. Um, one of the things that we've tried to think very carefully about, and this is work that's still ongoing, is to say, okay, we've got these principles, what do they mean in practice? 
and we're collecting a set of case studies that show us um, the seven that we developed, how they might actually be used meaningfully in a university classroom. So we're attempting to go a little bit further than what they generally do in these sorts of resources to say, what does this actually look like when teachers do it? And that's, that's kind of the tricky part to this. So there is a significant gap here, I think, between developing the kinds of principles that you see here and influencing policy, practice, what actually happens in the classroom. That's our challenge. It's something, again, that we, we wrote about and we particularly drew a lot on philosophy for this. This is kind of the hard problem of educational neuroscience, that researchers tend to talk a very different language to what teachers speak. Teachers need to know things, they've got a lot of other commitments in the classroom, they've got a classroom full of students they need to manage. Um, they need to think more carefully about how this evidence might impact on what they're doing. And this is the hard issue that we're dealing with. Part of what we also saw is that there is a, a kind of hierarchical way of thinking about what the evidence might look like, that a lot of, uh, particularly our, again our colleagues in, in neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, saw that if it was happening at the neuronal level, then it must be true. It's some sort of ground truth. Um, and the more I got into this, the more I wasn't very comfortable about that. Um, having actually done some of the neuroscience, I found that that was a little bit tricky and awkward. Um, we tended to think more about a kind of ecosystem of evidence where we're not necessarily kind of privileging one form of evidence over others because there are lots of reasons why um, certain forms of evidence are going to help particular teachers in particular classrooms that are not necessarily about um, generalizable ideas about how the brain works. But at the same time, there is a lot of really good stuff that's coming out of experimental psychology and neuroscience that can actually help us to think about what we're doing in different ways. Um, if treated carefully. So we're not, of course, not the only ones to try and look at this gap and think about how that might work. There is an emerging area of implementation science, particularly around using psychology uh, and neuroscience in education. So there's lots of discussion about this globally. Um, thankfully, people are thinking more carefully about what this might look like. For us, I think one of the key things that we got out of our conversations with our experts is that almost all of them mention design as a really important key uh, process for taking what we understand about what quality learning looks like and implementing it in the classroom. It, many of you have probably seen design process stuff before. This is a very simplified version. Of course, it, it often ends up more complicated than this, but you get the idea. So in this case, we're not starting from saying, we've got an image of a student's brain, here's what we should do. It's about understanding what's happening in a classroom environment, getting some sense of what might be going on, you know, developing um, a, a deeper understanding on the basis of theory and evidence, um, coming up with potential solutions, testing them out. So from there, it gave us some clues about various different points at which we could start to think about how that basic research might influence the way that we're understanding what's going on, the way that we might develop some ideas for things that we might change, and then how we might implement those changes and, and test them out. So there were multiple points at which we could start to have more meaningful conversations with teachers and policy makers about understanding their problems and coming up with potential solutions. The important thing was that that was very much based on a conversation. Right? It wasn't us as psychologists or neuroscientists going to teachers and policy makers and saying, our brain scans say that you should do this now. It's them saying to us, we're struggling with this issue or that issue, um, what does the research tell us about that? And then we have a conversation about how that might work, um, which has been probably not surprisingly much more fruitful uh, in the long run. So for us, our journey has told us that in, in terms of evidence-based or evidence-informed practice, um, it's it's been interesting to figure out how some of the principles might develop from neuroscience across down to the end when we're talking about educational research. But the key thing for us to be thinking about now is how implementation science and learning design can help us bridge the gap between the principles that we're learning from the research and how those actually work in policy and practice. And that's where we're investing a lot of our energy now to, to try and figure that out. Almost right on time. Uh, <laughs> thank you.